My mom moved to the United States. We had refugee status from the Soviet Union. Food stamps, welfare checks, all of that. The dad never came. We're still waiting, it's been 31 years, where, where is he? You don't have to come from a rich family. You don't have to be the great grandson of Warren Buffett for him to be your mentor. He's my mentor, I never met the guy. It was 13 years of capital gains that vanished in a week. That's the power of a dividend announcement. It doesn't matter nearly as much in what you invest versus how much and how often you invest. I always treated $10 like it's $100, 100 like it's 1000 and $1 like 10 I did that in, in reverse order. Maybe this can inspire someone else like that guy who wears a hoodie at night and is very cheerful and wears a straw hat, but also when I retire, right, when I'm work optional, I'm gonna need a hat to sit underneath the hot sun while I'm at the beach. It's in the five figures. At the end of the day, what is the most important thing is to be able to detach. Money is not life. Investors, welcome back to another episode of Masters of the Market. Now, this episode, I am just incredibly excited to have Georgie Roykman on with me to talk all about investing, but even more interestingly with this episode, to talk about trading cards. Now, Georgie is on a fire path, so financially independent, retire early. He's just about halfway there at half a million dollars but here to talk about this journey is georgie himself so georgie welcome to masters of the market and i want to just toss the first question right over to you what is your story and how did you get to where you are today first i have to say it is so cool to be in this seat right now and for you guys to be tuning in so how did i get into this whole world of investing was actually trading cards so i realized that certain i played games like pokemon ever since i was seven Yu Gi Oh when i turned nine i realized that there is foresight to this like there there's prices to every card and they serve a function in the game they offer a certain value and sometimes people haven't tapped into the full potential of a card like not everyone's using it yet and i was like hold on a second this card's nine dollars you get one in every like three boxes i'm buying everything I can. So I took the $300 I had when I was like 15 years old, I bought those cards out. And then literally a week later, instead of $9, they were $30 each. And I was like, so this, this is how the rich make money. They don't go to work. They find value where no one else sees it and they take it. And then they give it back to people who think that there's more value in it. Those cards actually ended up going up to like $70 each. So it was crazy. But that was one of my first big lessons about value and how money works. Instead of um, going to like, you know, a nine to five and trading time for it, it's more like you're trading your knowledge for the value. And when I learned that this is actually a thing called investing, I didn't even know that word existed when I was 15. I was I was a little bit slow to this. I learned about it when I turned 23 years old and I just started binging everything. Charlie Munger, Jack Bogle, Warren Buffett, all the, if you're 90 plus, I'm listening to you. So that's where I realized that what I was doing with cards was the same thing these billionaires were doing. And I was like, maybe I could up the scale and go from cards to corporations and that's how it started and then so that you you propelled yourself onto the fire journey like right from the get-go so from the very beginning i knew that investing is how rich people get rich it's not always in stocks it's not always in trading cards for example it can be real estate too there's so many avenues but i knew i had to park my money where value is found especially when i started learning about fire so I didn't know that there was this concept of actually retiring early. I didn't know that. I didn't really connect too much to money. I always was like, eh, those people are greedy millionaires. Uh, who, want, who wants to be greedy like that? They're always the villain in every story. But what I realized was that one, money is just the great magnifier. It shows more of who you are. Uh, if you're a greedy person, yeah, you're gonna be more greedy with the more you have. If you're a giving person, you'll be more giving. If you wanna provide for your family, you'll provide even more for your family. I started by just diving in. Um, I bought my first stocks and then, and only afterwards, when I didn't like the feeling of watching my money go down in value, that's <laughs> where I started actually like looking up strategies like dollar cost averaging, index funds, and learning as I went and eventually very quickly actually I learned that there's this strategy called fire this community right and they just 
try to accumulate a certain amount of money that they can live off of. And once I heard that idea, I was like, so that's the point of all of this. That's crazy. You could just earn a certain amount of money, get there, park it in uh, an index fund, maybe diversify a little bit beyond that. And you could take what you need. That's the dream. Why is no one doing this? And I just went in hard after that, created my system and just started running and still running. Georgie, I got to ask you. I mean, I feel the passion through the screen. For those of you who don't know Georgie, he has an amazing Instagram with a lot of insightful content. And I'm, I was, we were just talking before this. I was telling him how each post, I'm like, it actually grabs my attention. My question for you here is, where the heck does all of this energy, passion, you know, and, and the zest to be financially free really come from? Like from childhood, did you just, when it was the fire movement, the introduction to the fire movement, like where does it come from? So I run a page, it's called financialism because a lot of times when people look at finance, they think of like, you know, bunch of older dudes sitting at a computer and just clicking around be like, okay, diversify. Okay. That's a loan, all that stuff. And I was like, it doesn't have to be like this. It could be trading cards and flying to uh, Omaha, Nebraska and watching Warren Buffett speak Charlie Munger history in real time. Like it could be all that when it comes to zest. It's funny. You use that word. Uh, I have a client who, who uses that word to describe me, but I think I've always been passionate across the table but when I found out about money and how it works I was like this isn't just a good idea this is a practical idea in an hour in five minutes I can change someone's life by just spitting a couple facts about how money works and to me that is the ultimate form of power where words can change the future of someone's life that's incredible as an idea so I don't know how you can't be zesty when you have have like <laughs> this type of power at your fingertips to change lives that's crazy and so i definitely uh the other thing is i don't drink alcohol i don't drink coffee uh no drugs none of that It'll be i'm in tune with myself as much as i can be and i try to sleep my eight hours and go to the gym other than that and i picked a job that i really it picked me a job that i really 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 like working with autistic uh, children and teens young adults and that fuels me so like i'm not motivated with like fire where it's like let's quit the corporate like thing it's not about that i'm not trying to leave something i'm trying to access something i just want the freedom to be able to maybe i'll work a little bit less and work more on other passions that i have i'm just going to show you real quick right here that's a microphone i love to rap i don't know if you guys uh you know if, if you heard but if you go on spotify after this or during this you could check out financialism lazy boy and to the moon two rap songs all about investing and they're not cringy you'll probably listen you'll be like that's not bad that's not bad what i got from that is is like you have the idea and you're just on the run after it there's no hesitation so let me ask you this question georgie how do we all as maybe beginner investors or even more experienced investors who don't have this zestiness, right? How can we get it? Confidence comes from one place, genetics. No, not genetic. It comes from <laughs> knowledge, knowledge. Um, I consumed so many different videos, so many different audiobooks. Uh, see, earlier you were telling me, Ari, that you love to read and you read and read and read. For me, I started that way and I realized this is too slow. I'm a X2 speed type of uh, person. So I started listening to all these videos and podcasts and audiobooks on X2 speed. And if I could go faster, which on Spotify you can, uh, disclaimer, I am a shareholder. It's not going too well, but that is how I love to consume information. When I I was at uh, UCLA, I listened to my professor's lectures three times and I, and I would write them as well. So when I used to drive, don't try this at home, but I would listen to podcasts on my way home from my work. I learned so much in LA traffic. It's incredible. <laughs> I was in traffic for like three, four hours. I was like, great. I'm going to come out with like five podcasts all the way through. I would be covered in notes on my hands from like running out of paper. So don't do this. It's probably more dangerous than texting and driving, but it's really slow traffic. So don't do that. Um, I would literally write down everything I learned. I would come home, 
I would tell my mom everything I learned. And I was like, can we apply this? Like, this makes sense, right? Like a high yield savings account, a Roth IRA. Can we make one in the next four minutes? Let's, let's try it. I actually tried it and I timed it for my friends. I was like, it took me four minutes and 36 seconds to make a Roth IRA. What's the, what's taking you so long? It's been four years. Let's go. So that that's something. <laughs> I hope that answers uh, your question. Like the the confidence comes from knowledge. I would listen to the same uh, topic from multiple sources. From Andre Jick, we were talking about him. From from Graham Stephan and so on and so on. Listening to Warren Buffett, the Money Tree Investing Podcast. Every choose five. Um, over and over and over the same topics from different people at different stages of life. And they all had something in common. And that common thing, once I absorbed that, that's where the confidence came from. So when COVID happened, which was my first true test, the 2018 China trade wars, that was nothing. When COVID happened, ironically, the year before COVID, I reached on my very small, okay, relatively speaking, small salary it was about thirty thousand dollars right uh straight out of uh, uh college i managed to get to my first one hundred thousand yeah, dollars and and of course that comes from privilege there's a lot of privilege there but it's there's one thing having privilege and another one using it a lot of people have it and waste it but having it and using it maximizing it that's something to be proud of that's one of my pet peeves a little off topic but a lot of times people say oh your grandma paid for school i'm like that's generational wealth what are you trying to dis generation aren't you trying to build generational wealth my invisible microphone why are you dissing generational wealth this is something to celebrate the generation before you had enough wealth left over to hand down to the next one to make it a little bit easier and all of that helped me so much and i'm so proud and thankful for my grandparents for doing that saving their social security checks and putting it towards my university so i could have that head start not to squander not to take it easy but to use what they gave me to propel now i have this sounds bad, right? If you don't know how money works, but what they saved in 20 years, I created in four with a $30,000 income. That's crazy to think about the power at our fingertips when it comes to investing. So that's how I'll come one more time. I'm so zesty, so enthusiastic about this because this changes the lives. You know, it's interesting because I, as you were speaking, I'm like thinking about all the comments that I've gotten on some of these masters of the market videos, right? And and one of the most common ones that I've seen are like the, the haters, right? Like there's no way that you can make, you know, X amount from, you know, investing Y amount or on the flip side, oh, like you said, right? Your grandmother, your grandparents gave you the money. That's how you got rich. And what's interesting to me is, you know, one thing I always say when responding to these comments is like, I have a book recommendation, Millionaires Next Door, right? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the books, if you read a lot of that mindset, right, the millionaire mindset, go one above the billionaire mindset, which you can learn about through just listening to a lot of the wealthy folks. They talk about focus. They talk about passion. And just going after it. And yes, you can have, in, in your case, right, that privileged right upbringing. I wouldn't even say that your case is privileged. If I had to be honest, some people well, would, no. right? But for me, I'm like, no, here's someone who who got it, it at a young age and started running. And, and right. this is yeah. called where work, right, really comes uh, and meets the, the elders, right, your grandparents and picks up on all of it. But I want to ask you this. So $30,000 after college, you start working. I'm sure you were already hustling and investing and doubling down on savings and all and everything in between, which we'll get to in a second. Where are you right now today? How much, what's the value of your portfolio, net worth? Where are you on this fire journey? I believe in absolute transparency, which is where my grand, we come from the Soviet Union. Like my, my, uh, birth certificate says USSR because uh, even though it fell apart beforehand, I come from a very frugal uh, society <laughs> where they're going to use up every last paper from the USSR, even though it collapsed <laughs> until it, 
it's all used up. So I inherited that. That's one of my inheritance is those values. So I just wanted to talk very briefly like about your point about br privilege before I reveal the net worth. I'll just skip to it. It's over $500,000. What the heck? I am not smarter than anyone watching this. Maybe a few of you. But I am definitely not smarter than a majority of the people watching this. Yes, this is replicable. Yes, it, you can't replicate having a grandma with that mindset. That's hard. But the steps I took, I could have done that without my grandma. Now, she made it a lot easier. Why? Because I knew safety when I was at home. I knew I could study it, without guns going off, sirens going off. I could do that. And that, of course, shaped the way that I study finances, where I felt comfortable doing it in my car. It's not work for me. It's fun for me to learn. And that's all because grandma made my mashed potatoes and she gave it to me. So that is another type of inheritance. And for anyone wondering how much money did I inherit? That's very hard to calculate. Inheritance, usually someone passes away and they leave money for you. I had about 10K, right? 10K, that, that's a, that's not a small amount of money. I know some people say a million dollars is a small amount of money. I don't think 10,000 is a small amount of money, especially with what you can do with that these days. As a starting sum, that's a great amount of money. And I was very, very lucky to have it. And I turned it into or rather, the people of the corporations, the workers, turned it into $500,000. All I did was bought the, the stocks that they were working for, those companies, and uh, generated so much profit. And that showed inside of the portfolio, right? And um, that, that's how it happened, 500 k But it's not all stocks. It's uh, collectibles as well. Investing in places where the institutions aren't yet is a very smart move. Uh, I think maybe five years ago, that was all what crypto was about, but now it's part of the institution. So is it really like anti everything? I don't know. It seems like it's a part of everything now. So 500 k that's how we got here. Uh, behaviorally, I did inherit a lot of habits from my grandma, and that comes from that tough communist type upbringing. Talk about two or three of those habits. <laughs> I'm going to bag on the United States. I'm so thankful, United States. I'm so thankful. But I'm just going to say there is some really strong marketing that we can learn from, right? Every one of us is going to be a prisoner of that marketing one way or another. It, it works. Trust me, it works. You, you think it doesn't work, and that means that it's working. So um, a lot of people here associate that, and you might not be from the U.S., but trust me, we, we got to you guys too. Um, whenever you are spending money you think that you're inheriting a quality of life increase that's not true a lot of my habits my grandma was not going to spend 40 dollars on shoes 20 dollars that's the limit if it's 21 mm, i don't know i have to wait for my birthday what i would do is all of my habits involve freebies like going to the beach going hiking and i live in la so there's a lot of that yeah you got to grind through traffic and there's gas but uh, you got to pay in some way but most of my hobbies were like that trading cards a lot of people say to play a trading card game that's very expensive it's not if you win but also if you hold the cards they do retain value and you trade you learn to trade with other players and sometimes every trade is there, there's a battle going on you're getting a little bit of profit so even though i put in maybe thousands of dollars in to those hobbies, I definitely got back more than what I put in. So choosing hobbies where there's either a one-time cost and you're going to do it like the microphone I showed you, right? And you might even generate some money off of that or hobbies that are free, going to the beach, boogie boarding, one-time cost, you buy that board, surfboard, sure, it breaks. Yeah, that happens. But for the average person, they're not going to break it. It's more of a mindset as a habit. So like behaviors can be thoughts too. Like I have to train myself to think positively because there's a lot of negativity out there and being positive for the sake of being positive isn't the answer, right? Like there's times like, oh, that sucks. Like people, people suffering right there. There's no positive spin to that, except how can we help, right? That, that comes in my grandma, one story I need to share that like these, the stories that she told me is what creates these types of habits, right? This frugality where I'm not giving anything up. My life is, I think, extremely wealthy and it's not correlated with my spending at all. I don't think wealth is correlated with how much you can spend. Um, my grandma, when we moved into uh, the condo that my mom owns now, within a month, they needed to repaint the whole thing, $10,000. Mom drops to the floor, cries. It's like, how, how? Grandma, never cry 
over money. It's not life. Pulls out 10 grand. Those are the habits. Saving for an emergency. Knowing where what to cry over, which is life, not money. Okay, that those it's not really one or two habits. It's more of a habit and a mindset, but that unlocks a whole entire world, a whole world. Fitness also, that's another important habit to have. And you don't need a gym membership to do that. You can do push-ups anywhere. Man, I, I love it. I love that you talked about the mindset and the habits though, because it they're actually, it's, it's both, right? Like even from every Masters of the Market chat, every book that I've read about the millionaire mindset, and I think it was 2019, I, I was obsessed with learning the millionaire's mindset. It was yeah. taking massive action, like just doing. I don't even want to say massive action, just the baby step. Just do, do something. Mm -hmm. And the other element of that was like, just be smart. You know, you don't need to buy everything you see. You don't need to be a kleptomaniac. Just save, just put away, just invest. Now, I want to get a little bit here into your investments in this portfolio of yours. Break it down for us. What does it look like? for what it looks like today, right? So maybe this can inspire someone else like, wow, that guy who wears a hoodie at night and is very cheerful and wears a straw hat for some weird reason. <laughs> it's because of the One Piece anime. I'm a big fan. I've been doing this for a long time with the straw hat. But also when I retire, right, when I'm work optional, I'm gonna need a hat to sit underneath the hot sun while I'm at the beach. I'm actually gonna be riding the wave so I can't wear the hat. But anyways, this is, uh, this is Luffy. Um, when it comes to my portfolio, when it there's a, a stock portion, there's a crypto portion, a small cash portion, and a collectibles portion, and a small window for weird random stuff that just to try out, um, such as even NFTs, which I kind of put into the collectibles uh, portion there. Um, and I know there's a lot of negativity and fear and like scamminess around all of that, which uh, I would love to navigate with everyone here. Uh, that's one of my passions is breaking stereotypes, even though I agree 99% of it is is scammy and fishy, but there's that 1% baby, you probably won't find it. But if you do good job, uh, let me know what it is. Um, so about 15% of my portfolio, the 15% I love to talk about, which is funny because it's only 15% is trading cards and collectibles. I think that there's a lot of value in being able to touch something that unlocks a nostalgia that throws you back to second grade with you and your best friends before any type of suffering. That is an inc what would you pay if a pill could do that you swallow a pill and it takes you back to your favorite time in life, one of your favorite times in life, because you never know, maybe some of it's in the future. It definitely is. Um, that's an amazing feeling. And so buying a trading card that unlocks or represents those memories, that's huge, huge. I have a client, he is obsessed with flags. But every flag, it's not just pictures. When he looks at a flag, he knows all the political ideologies that is represented by that flag. So just like that flag is a symbol for him that unlocks all of this knowledge or reminds him of it, my cards remind me of memories. And I, as an investor, come into this place and I'm like, what are the most valuable memories that people have and how can I capitalize off them? And I do. I find ways. You, people won tournaments with this card in 2012. They're going to want to relive that. I'm going to buy the most high-end, scarce version of this card, and I'm going to lock it up. And in 10 years, when those people have money, <laughs> they're going to want to buy it, and I'm going to be right there to sell it to them. But there's also quick flips that I do with that world, and it's so much fun. But if it all goes to zero, my life does not change. That's why most of it is in stocks. Uh, ETFs, index funds, and individual positions. Uh, we can definitely dissect more into the card world. There's so much to break down collectibles in general. Just the rules of value are so different there. Um, it's you really focusing on the subjective, but all value is subjective in a sense. So when I, uh, that's a philosophy. No, that's an opinion. So when I look at my stock portfolio, which is about, I want to say, closer to maybe three hundred eighty thousand dollars something like that and i have maybe like 60 to 70k in cards which is very flu 
fluctu fluctuates a lot. When it comes to my portfolio, like the traditional portfolio with those guys who was on the computer, it's still a lot of fun. I love communities. I love the Berkshire Hathaway community. I think of that as a soft ETF without an expense ratio. I don't get any dividends off that. I know you might be mad about that. Um, but I still take that. And that is a part of history for me. I look at that as a collector. I have Berkshire Hathaway stuff. That is cool. Maybe I'm a sucker for doing that. But I'm also incredibly attached to the story of Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. I learned a lot from my grandma. And they're 10 years older than her. So that, uh, Charlie's like uh, 10 years older. Warren Buffett's right her age. I, that's so. That's 10 years more of wisdom. I'll take that. Not that it's always about how long you live. There's definitely 10-year-olds wiser than, than me. But with that being said, a lot of it is about 70% of that 380, maybe 400K it is um, in index funds that track the market. Now, some of it tracks like a certain sector, like the tech sector with VGT. I'm a big fan of that, but I'm, I don't go too hard on that because the United States already does that. So it gets a little bit redundant, but I can't help. Maybe this will help me retire three days earlier. So I'm about taking those kind of uh, mm, asymmetrical risks. I'm, I'm totally on board with that. A majority of it, one position is VOO, classic ETF. I'm all for it. Now, I started investing. If you guys remember from the beginning of the video, Ari, I mentioned that I had not the biggest idea of what I was doing. I was just buying stocks and know that this is how people get rich. And then I learned on the way. So I learned about index funds probably like two, three years into my journey. So I bought a what load of individual positions. You could probably like call it the financialism index. Uh, it tracks all the fun stocks, all the companies I was interested in back then. And uh, some of them include like Block, formerly known as Square. I was like, this is the big tech, I'm going in. I rode that out, I rode that out hard. Um, Meta is another one that I'm sitting on uh, and classic dividend stocks as well. I know you love those and a lot of people watching love those and they're classic and loved for a reason. There is history behind it and you already know I love history. So I'm buying history. Johnson & Johnson, I know they split into two companies, all that. You still could take hits with those companies. Like Triple M is down like quite a bit, right? Maybe buy an opportunity, maybe not. That's mostly how my portfolio is broken down. And then I have about, I want to say, thirty five dollars to $40,000 in crypto, which I treated like a Subway sandwich. Instead of actually going, I make my sandwich at home. I don't actually eat any animals, but I make my sandwich at home and with that i don't go to subway but i pretend that i do so i take that 14 dollars and i throw it into crypto not every day i created a system when the market crashed in crypto 80 percent crash i was like let's go great depression there's some deals out here of course a lot of suffering a lot of crypto got locked up into different account in uh different uh platforms like voyager went down celsius went down i went down with them but that created a wave of deals because if they didn't crash if those platforms didn't crash bitcoin and ethereum would not be steals at those prices so i was like look i could cry about losing all that money which i actually got back out if you're a celsius investor you you could get that out uh 75 of it unless it was in an earn account or not an earn in a custodial account then you get 100 percent back which is crazy i got my first ethereum coin back out of there i was like let's go um so at the end of the day, uh, that created a huge opportunity. And I went in and I started Subway sandwiching into crypto, never abandoning my uh, minimum amount that I'm allowed to invest or, or have to invest uh, into the S&P 500, into classical dividend stocks, into my stock portfolio. That never gets sacrificed, not for a card opportunity. I don't care how good of an opportunity it is. Those principles stick to them. I invest about um, $2,400 for my 4,500 monthly income into the stock market, no matter what happens. That breaks down the portfolio. All that's left to talk about is the cash. And there's about ten dollars to $12,000 in cash, which is much more than I usually have in cash. I don't have any uh, dependents. There's no children or anything like that. Uh, so I am comfortable with having a smaller cash fund, but I'm also an opportunist. If I see a card deal, I want to have cash. And one atypical thing is I just keep it in my Bank of America account instead of a high yield fund because I want fast 
access. If I see a deal for $8,000 and I think that card's worth 12K, I can't afford to wait three days to get it out of a high yield savings account. So I need to make that deal and I'll make more money doing that than passively through a high yield account. And I think that sums it all up. One thing that you said that really caught my attention was actually how you turned the Subway sandwich into the verb, right? Like I'm Subway sandwiching my way. And again, this reminds me of just like, just start, just keep going. Right. And like shift that mindset. Everybody's buying the Starbucks coffee, the Dunkin' Donuts coffee, take that money, put it in the market, yep. the start the, the, the sandwich, take that sandwich money, that lunch money, put it into the market. What would you share with someone to actually just help encourage them to do exactly that? I'm just going to say it. If you're watching this video, then you're already either doing it or you have what it takes to do it. And I'm gonna say everyone has what it takes, but for some people it is buried so deep that there is, they need to meet the right person from the right ethnic background, from the education that they happen to have at the same school, like all that has to align. I will not have the right words to save everyone. And that's why there's more than one human on earth and more than one language and more than one culture. You might have to hear it from someone from a similar background as you or a radically different background or someone from a different gender or someone from different philosophies on gender than you. Um, Sometimes you never know who it's going to be more than what. Um, for example, I could tell my mom that <laughs> when the COVID crash happened, we would go at it every day. And that kind of prepared me for Instagram haters and you YouTube haters in the comments. I'm going to be reading every one of those and answering. Uh, it prepared me because every time she said, look, Joe Biden is saying da 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 da. Donald Trump is saying da da da. If both Joe and Donald are saying, then, and I'm like, okay, mom, let's see what the data is saying and my mom was like okay, okay 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 so i knew data worked on my mom but every day it would be the same battle now i know if warren buffett told her the same thing i told her she would not come back the next day and challenge warren buffett right <laughs> even though he said the same thing i said so sometimes it's not the message it's the messenger can they get it is it a person you're connected to is it a person you respect or is it like my mom always tells me Stop wearing hoodies and straw hats. Can you just be like that guy, Ari, wear a regular shirt, have a nice haircut, not that long thing. What are you doing? Uh, not cutting your hair until you bench 225 pounds. That's a weird challenge, son. It's going to be up to here. So it's not for everyone. Hoodie and straw hat with holes in it. It's not, not everyone's going to resonate with that. But other people, they'll be like, he said, Subway sandwiching his way. I am going to make a sandwich at home, take $14. I have no idea what I'm doing. And I'm going to buy, what do he say, Vu? Vu? Okay, I'm going to buy Vu. Go on Robinhood app, Vu. Boom. Done. Oh, he said Robinhood app? I'm not listening to that guy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Robinhood steals the AMC. And if I just said Charles Schwab in that example, then... 14% of other people would start investing and they would subway sandwich their way. So there's so many ways. That's why I make the same video on Instagram, on YouTube over and over again, slightly tinkering it out and uh, making different skits with that. Hopefully it'll hit someone. So another thing is consistency, which you have noticed your channel is growing. This community is strong. I'm an investor. I see where the value is. Like people might look right now on today. They'd be like 18,000 uh, followers. That's, that's not bad. That's pretty good subscribers. Me. I don't see 18,000. I see 180,000, right? Future oriented. I see the value. So I'm like, if I could get in on these early episodes, when he has a hundred K, I'm going to come back and get a shout out. So, um, that's all what investing is about. Hopefully that message right there was enough. I talk about it day in and day out with my coworkers and some of them, they have all the privilege and they're not gonna use it. And I stopped wasting my energy on certain ones and others, they're 24 with a baby, way less privilege, right? And in a way, way more privilege but from different perspectives, right? So for them, I'm like, wow, they're asking me, what's a Roth IRA? How do I make one? Come back to work the next day and they show me, I made it, what's next? I'm like, yes, yes.
But for other people, I'm like, hey, watch this YouTube video. They don't watch it. They don't watch it. I'm going to save my energy, move to the next person, and trust maybe that 24-year-old uh, with the baby will talk to that person because it's not just investing in assets. It's investing in people who, in turn, will invest in other people and teach them this because it's so exciting, and uh, the community changes. Georgie, every time you share, I get like 50 new questions, and it's <laughs> so hard to pick which one I want to run with. But – for this next question, uh, I'm going to revert back to something that you said a little earlier and then jump forward because I have there's just too many questions. So you got it. I'm going to throw this one your way. When it comes to collectibles, a lot of I mean, I would imagine so many people would be frightened to get into collectibles. But then you compared it to to stocks, right? That nostalgia. It brings back this feeling of like, I want to be a part of this. I want to be, you know, I want to remember that. Can you talk to us a little bit more about collectibles? And if and any of us out there wanted to dive into collectibles, what are like the couple of things that we should be aware of when we just get started? One, Berkshire Hathaway. Six, oh, the, the class A shares, $600,000. What does it mean when a stock's going up? That means more people are buying than selling, right? That's basic uh, stock market 101 stuff. Can you convince someone who's held it since it was 20K to sell it at 600K? That is hard. All the memories, all the annual shareholder meetings, that is hard. They're not holding that just like a stock, just like a company. It's a badge of honor. It is a memory travel. It is a time travel tool that takes them back to moments in their life that are so rich and wealthy and they're taking that and giving it to the next generation that's beautiful and that's exactly what the collectible market does um the reason why a charizard first edition from the pokemon trading card game from 1999 in perfect gem mint 10 today sells for hundred eighty thousand dollars. there's a reason because the coolest kid on the playground in second grade he didn't even have it his older brother had it and you knew that there was no way you were getting it but now that you're making real money right all money is real uh, uh, shout out to israel right there but um all money is very very real i always treated ten dollars like it's a hundred dollars a hundred like it's a thousand and one dollar like ten i did that in, in reverse order so when it comes to collectibles you are buying something that is worth more than money to some people i went my girlfriend is obsessed with Star Trek. She loves the original Star Trek. She took me to a Star Trek museum, a convention in, in the LA area. And I went and I was looking at these $50,000 supposedly tunics that Spock wore. And I'm like, okay, interesting. Wow. Okay. Then I started reading the owner's names, Alan Green, Jeff Bezos, Microsoft founder, Amazon founder. What the heck? These are the, these are the people whose stocks I buy. They're buying this? And then I started having thought experiments. Jeff Bezos buys a rare uh, Star Trek collectible for 15 grand. If I walk up to him and tell him, hey, Jeff, yo, I, I love what you've done with Amazon. I, I do think that it was better when it was just a bookstore. But um, now you've got this Star Trek toy you bought for 15K. I'll give you, you just bought it yesterday. I'm going to give you $23,000 on it right now. What's he going to do? $8,000 isn't going to tempt him. Okay, Jeff, 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 Jeff. Let me give you $60,000 for that toy. This is a one of one. Financialism, Georgie, whoever you, a straw hat boy, get away from me. I'm not taking $60,000, $120,000. Get the heck out of my face, right? He will value that more than money. It's a one of one. Money is printed all the time, right? He, I could give him Amazon stock. He could create Amazon stock. So you can't get that from Jeff Bezos for any amount of money and i know that because he has all the money that a human can want it's mostly in shares but still it's more money than any human can reasonably need to survive so when it comes to collectibles good luck convincing someone to sell the only reason a charizard is one hundred eighty thousand is because people refuse to sell it for 170 
thousand. There are some exceptions. Sometimes you take a gamble and you put it on auction. You don't know what you're going to get. But if you're putting it on auction, that means you're willing to sell. And there's also value comes from scarcity, right? There's a certain limit to stocks and how many there are. Whenever a company produces more stock to raise funds, well, the stock usually crashes. Sometimes the reverse might happen, but usually it crashes. And so when it comes to these collectibles, there's only say 136 charizards that were graded over 20 year time 25 year time period in 10 out of 10 condition this is my invisible charizard right here that i'm holding in 10 out of 10 condition so you have to you can't just say i have 200 grand let me buy it you can't do that you have to find one of those people who is willing to leave that nostalgia behind and um and actually go ahead and buy and buy one of those Charizards. This is not the one hundred eighty thousand dollar one, but this is this is like in the, it's it's in the it's in the five figures. So this is one of those Charizards that I thought was very very worthwhile. It sold for about forty five thousand dollars before I purchased it, never thinking I would win. And before that forty five thousand mark, it sold for sixty nine thousand. And I put in a bid for 23,000, which was all my emergency fund that I knew I was gonna rebuild real quick. And I never thought I would win it. Then I won it. And I'm like, what the heck? My mom's gonna be so mad because I tell her all my money stories. <laughs> but that is just one example of why uh, people value. I brought that out just, just for this, just to show and tell. It's going back in the vault, but just wanted to show people that people, if, if you think I'm crazy for paying like 20,000, 23,000 for that card, Someone before me paid 45,000 and before them for 69,000, right? So there's clearly a value here. Sales are far and few in between. Why? Because when you invest in a collectible, you're not investing to have something liquid. It's not like a stock. You can't sell it like this. You have to talk and communicate with a community. You have to be trusted and respected in that community. You have to show honor in that community. If uh, you ship a card, it gets lost in the mail. You take responsibility for the mail person. Uh, all of those things. You go to card shows. You meet. You shake hands. You know their babies' names. Um, that's uh, that's all incredibly important in this world and how you actually build value because people will pay. 190,000 to buy that Charizard from a reputable source rather than 180,000 in auction from an unknown source. Maybe that 10 is not a perfect 10, right? Maybe the grading company got it wrong. So knowing people, I love that element to it. It's, it's an element in the business world. It's an element in human life. So I feel like collectibles really bring people together. Because it's all about love. And, and then all of the other people, 180000 really? It actually sold for $420,000 just a year ago. So we're in a wow. big crash right now. Yeah, that so is crash absolutely mind-blowing um, to think about. Mm -hmm. And also really exciting, though, because it's like that you talk about that nostalgia. Everyone wants to go back in time. Everyone wants to win their time back. Uh, so these are the little pieces in which we can absolutely do that. You talked a lot about trust and community and honor and, you know, these these strong words around really having a strong circle around you. And I'm curious to know, because in order to really build wealth, and I'm sure you've experienced this, you need that strong circle. You talked about your grandmother, family. I'm curious to know about this fire movement of your who you're hanging out with what do friends say do they think you're crazy do they think you're too frugal <laughs> <laughs> what's that all about can you talk to us about yeah. that so when it comes to friendship circles there's this saying and i actually i i see the wisdom in it but i don't like it um they say you are who you surround yourself with um or the habits of the five people around you will become your habits. There's so much truth there, but I don't like it. I don't like it because it means you will exclude people simply because they don't have as much passion as you. And I am so passionate that their bad habits will not influence all of my, come on, every single human tried something weird in their lifetime. I haven't even tried ketchup. I'm scared of ketchup. I haven't tried alcohol. I haven't tried marijuana, anything like that. I haven't tried any. <laughs> thing like that um so the peer pressure of my friends not enough now i haven't convinced any of my friends to stop drinking and, and, and all that and they see how happy i am they're a little bit more sluggish that's okay i'm not here to judge i'm judging judging uh, you always need a friend who will judge you fairly or what they think is fair they'll be honest with you in a nice way so i believe that it is up to you 
to be that circle. So none of my friends talked about investing with me. They didn't. So what, what did I do? I went and remembered a story my mom shared when she came here. So yeah, we talk about privilege, right? And you, are you, I shared some private details of my life, which are not private. There's no secrets here. So my mom moved to the United States. She didn't just move. We had refugee status from the Soviet Union. We came here because uh, Jewish people were being discriminated against there. Now, my mom is an honorary Jewish lady because uh, she married into a Jewish family. The dad never came. We're still waiting. It's been 31 years. Where, where is he? He never came. She was abandoned with a baby in the United States of America with little English, little money, knows zero people besides his parents, the abusive in-laws. So what 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 are we going to do with that? Uh, she went. There was no internet back then. Not, not like this. She went to the park and she started with community. She started, oh, there's a kid that's your age, a little girl. Let me talk to her mom. We both speak Russian. Amazing. Let's form a... Hey, I need to learn English. Can you watch him while um, I go learn English at night, at night school? And then um, I'll in exchange on the weekend, I'll watch your daughter. I'll take her to the park. You take some time. So those exchanges started happening. And eventually it came to the point where my mom learned computer programming because of wow. all of those connections, talking to everyone. She was like, Okay, I come from the USSR, which did give me a great education, debt free. One of the great things about the Soviet Union is the education it provided. She took that, right? She didn't cry about it. She didn't even realize how bad she had it. She had it so bad that people would pull over on the street and be like, I see you at this bus stop every single day. Can I give you a lift? People would give her groceries. And she didn't, she was like, oh, that's nice. Now thinking back, she's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I was in it like that. We had food stamps, welfare fair checks, all of that. And she climbed out of it. So I saw the power of community. But at the same time, I live in a not so prosperous area of the world. Prosperous in a sense where like other people here are uh, from immigrant families without too many resources. A lot of the kids at my school, they had free government uh, lunches, things like that, right? Now there's of course a lot of love there, a lot of energy, but financially a lot of people broke and um, not spiritually though. So there, there's so much wealth. I'm not taking away from that. But what I learned from that was sometimes you have to go to the other side of the table. Like sometimes people, they just eat what's in front of them. And there's all this cool stuff on the other side. Well, who said that's not for you? So I went on the internet and I was like, money, Instagram, that guy, he's 27 or back then he was 25. That's how old I am. What's he doing? How does he have $500,000 already at that age? I have another guest recommendation for you. Shout out to my friend, Jay Millennial. Um, how did he do that? And we just started talking and he loved talking about money, had not too many people in real life to talk about it with. So we talked about it online. Then I found another friend and another friend. And all of a sudden we had a whole knit community on Instagram. These people lived on the East coast in the middle of the United States. Some, some of them outside the United States and we we're all messaging, DMing each other to the point where I would take what they would say. I would connect it to the podcast and all that, that I would listen to. And I'm be like, how do I get my friends from over here to do the same thing? So I would re-record it with them in mind. And then I would be like, oh, I'm going to send this to you. And that's how it happens. It's not the people I know physically, right? This is the privilege of the 21st century. We got the internet. So when I saw Ari had an amazing YouTube channel, I was like, wow, amazing people are on this. I want to be affiliated in some way. Let me just say hi. Maybe he'll ignore me. Maybe he'll say hi back. I sent a message and here we are not a week later talking about it. And that's the power of the 21st century. You don't have to come from a rich family. You don't have to be the great grandson of Warren Buffett for him to be your mentor. He's my mentor. I never met the guy, right? All of his lessons are online for free. Tap in. I absolutely love that, Georgie. The reason why Masters of the Market was created in the first place was actually because it's something you just mentioned. The everyday Joe can, if they want to, become incredibly wildly successful and make it. And so I wanted to create something that would help others understand that it's all possible. It's all possible. Just do. Stop talking. Stop sitting around. Do. Just start doing. And what I hear in every story that you share is like, I looked at him. He was 25. I was 25. I just started. Why not me? And so I want to say thank you for sharing that. 
And I'm, I'm just hopeful that everybody listening is like, wow, I don't know. Maybe I should get a straw hat. Maybe, maybe I should go <laughs> like find Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon, but like just do. Now, this next question, I, I want to get back into investing here and have you break down how many stocks are in your portfolio, how many growth stocks, how many dividend stocks, how many ETFs for all of us. If we're out there thinking, well, I want a portfolio like Georgie's, how do we build it? So here's the wisdom that was uh, taught to me by other people on the same journey. And, and when I heard it, I was like, that doesn't make any sense. And they were like, it doesn't matter. At, it does matter. It doesn't matter nearly as much in what you invest versus how much and how often you invest. You will self-correct. You're a human, you're, you're learning on the way. That's okay, you don't need to have a perfect system. I didn't even knew cryptocurrency would be part of my path when I started this journey, I had no idea. I didn't think I would buy $20,000 in one single Pokemon card. I didn't think any of that, right? So the system adjusts, but you have to create rules in your system for adjustments. So. When it comes to breaking down my portfolio like that, a lot of my individual positions came from the before time. This was before I knew. And so I bought them just because they were big brand names. And no one's going to say, I did all this research, blah, blah, blah. I did it because I wanted to hit the ground running. And if that money were to go to zero, I made sure to buy so many positions that it can't be that all of them would go to zero, which of course, right? The more you diversify, the less sharp your sword is. It stunts how fast you could grow. Now, there's exceptions, of course, but if you have one position and it doubles, then it doubles. If you have 20 positions and one of them doubles, well, then okay, cool. Um, so I have probably 70 different individual positions. Do I know them all intimately? No. But one of my rules is do not sell. So I know you talk about selling losers and how that could be an important strategy. And that goes to show there are so many philosophies in this world. For example, two of my largest returns came because I followed my rule of do not sell until you need it. Or it's just way too good to be true. And my way too good to be true does have objective numbers. It has um, maybe not objective. They're kind of randomly picked those numbers. But I'm like, this is a number that is too good to be true. So I'll just tell the story. No secrets. I bought the company Overstock, now bought by Beyond, uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. And so Overstock was trading for $60, $50, $40, all the way down COVID hit. COVID hit and their uh, CEO, who, by the way, his, uh, I believe, father or grandfather bought, uh, sold Berkshire Hathaway to Warren Buffett. So all of it's inter interconnected. Uh, fact check that. But no, it's a true story. It sounds wild because he fell in love with a Russian spy and then he was on Fox News. He was talking about it. Then he left his job, went all in on crypto, blah, 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 blah. I think he's doing well now with the price of Bitcoin. But anyways, Overstock crashed during that time from $60 all the way down to $2 and like 64 cents. I held, I was down 90%. Not only was I down 90%, it was the pandemic. It was March. It was March 12th. That is that red. It was bad times. And I was like, I read about the stock levies being pulled and like um, the, the circuit breakers. And all of a sudden, like you can't trade anymore. The stock market's closed for 10 minutes. And if it happens again, it's closed for 30 minutes. So seeing all that happen, I was like, I'm a part of history. Um, but also <laughs> during that time, I was um, just accepting that this is reality. 90% down in a certain position. I didn't sell. What's the point of selling a 90? Might as well write it out. So I wrote it out and that I put in about $6,500. They promised a special dividend, one share of a special, a special dividend share. Costco does that some, well, they, they do a cash dividend, but some companies give you a special side share uh, for holding for a very long time. In addition to a dividend, uh, a regular dividend, this company had no dividend. This was their, they were just like only special dividends. So I got that. Um, we were all waiting for that 10% uh, dividend because it's one for every share, but the price was so low. It's like, well, okay, minus 90% for, uh, you know, 10% extra. That's cool. That $6,500 turned into $6,500. Back then I was making about $2,500 to $3,000 a month. That's almost two years of, in, uh, two months of income gone. I held it.
And I'm glad I did because what went up during the pandemic? Well, people are in home. What can they do? They can redesign the area that they live in. So stores like Overstock, um, Restoration Hardware, which Berkshire Hathaway purchased um, at that time, um, Wayfair, even though there was like conspiracy theories about it that are not true at all. Um, all of that, those companies soared 10x but overstock soared 50x. This was that Tesla time period where people were buying Tesla every single day on TikTok. You're scrolling Tesla, 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 Tesla. Um, overstock times 50 during the same time Tesla, Tesla did it times 12 or whatever it did. So I wrote it all the way back up and way no pun intended, beyond. It was $20,000 when I sold for a profit, paid my taxes, sold for a profit. I only kept the original $6,500 that I had invested in the first place still with it. And I took that money and I gradually invested it across the next four months into more index funds. And that's one position. The other position, to keep a long story short, was Ethereum. I had no idea what I was doing. I bought it for $875 and it went up to $1,200 and dropped. It dropped to $83. This was around 2017, 2018, 90% gone. Today, it's trading for about 3.4K right now. It reached a high of 4.9K. That's crazy. But imagine my one regret, I don't know if you're going to ask me this question, but my one regret is I didn't apply the same methodologies that I do with the stocks, that I do with the collectibles, with things like the crypto and the overstock, right? With individual companies, I feel bad averaging in. Uh, it, it just feels wrong to me. I'm like an index fund price doesn't matter. With an with a stock, it kind of matters a little bit more there. So if I had just averaged in, um, we wouldn't be having this talk. I would I would be right there next to you. I would fly in for this interview. I would be way wealthier buying dollar cost averaging using those principles that all the greats talk about across all investing asset classes. So. I don't know if that answered the question directly, but about 30% is individual positions. Berkshire Hathaway is one of them. That's a, one of the big ones. Apple is another huge one. Disney is another one that I hold, and that one's not doing too well. They got rid of that dividend, and uh, when they got rid of it, the price tanked. It tanked so hard that I did the math. It was 13 years of capital gains that vanished in a week. That's the power of a dividend announcement, right? Now they got it back. And perhaps Disney's a little undervalued now, or maybe it's the market that's overvalued and Disney's regular price, but that's for you guys to think about. So that more or less in a nutshell is my stock part of the portfolio with again, mostly everything being in VOO, um, SPY. I, the reason why I have two of the same exact thing is because I didn't know any better. I didn't know what an expense ratio was. I just bought whatever uh, was closest to the S&P 500. Then I learned VU might be a little bit more worth it because the fees are a little bit less. So all that you learn on the way. Now imagine I waited. Well, we wouldn't even be having a Zoom conversation right now because I'd still be waiting. Let me ask you this question, Georgie. It sounds like a lot of what you talked about, right? was like fear. People don't buy because of fear. People sell because of fear. They don't sell because of fear. There's just fear all over the place. What it sounds like to me is you may have had fear on your journey, but over time, you've really learned how to manage fear, sit calmly and comfortably, from what I can understand, in the midst of fear. How, Very how can we hone in on that energy to, to really get calm, to really get focused and to really have the never sell mentality that you have? Well, my wisdom comes not from me. It comes from the 90 year olds. So when you ask Warren Buffett, what's your favorite holding period? He says forever. And I'm like, why would a dude who's been investing his whole life say that and arguably considered one of the greatest investors of the world? Is this just a coincidence or is this wisdom to pursue? Now, I don't have fear. I have discomfort, right? Uh, when my stocks fell, my life isn't going to change. Even at that point where, yeah, I realize that's two months of uh, income gone. It's not gone. It's paper loss. That's not a good feeling. But was I scared? Was I going to go hungry? Heck no. I had my bases covered. I had an emergency fund at that time, which was good enough if anything were to happen, right? So an emergency fund isn't always cash, by the way. It could also be people, relatives, right? 
of friends. If the worst happens, do you have a buddy who has a couch for you? That's an emergency fund too. So don't be thinking, oh, I'm so behind. No, social connections. That's how my mom started. Her biggest capital was her social capital, her cultural capital of enticing people with the way she spoke based on the books she read, right? She had no money, very little money besides what uh, the government gave her. You should guys check out my song, Mama and Me on Spotify. It tells that story about uh, back in the 1993, 94 era when we came here. But, um, <sighs> Fear is, you're going to do it scared, right? Uh, it's like Taylor Swift once said, like, oh, uh, bravery is not the absence of fear. It's doing it while experiencing the fear. But when you have knowledge, you have less fear. If you are competent in what you are doing, you realize there's going to be downs and ups. And that's true for anything in life. Relationships. You think you're not going to argue with your spouse? Not you. Of course, you guys are perfect. But no, part of being perfect is arguing and knowing how to argue. There's going to be downs. There's going to be moments where you hate the other person, right? Or two people if you're freaky. I don't know. I'm not judging you. This is a family-friendly page. But, um, Doing it with the fear of things going up and down. When you have the knowledge, when you have the competency, you're going to be not impacted by it because you have that future foresight. I'm scared right now. I'm mad right now. I'm frustrated. I didn't dollar cost average into Ethereum, even though all the great people said that this is one of the greatest investing methodologies, not necessarily asset classes, but use this methodology, use this strategy. And I didn't use it and I knew better and I regret it. But <laughs> some trains pass, you let them go, there will be more. Because after Ethereum, there were so many other coins and mistakes that I made. But um, at the end of the day, what is the most important thing is to be able to detach, to know that, like my grandma said, money is not life. Humans have existed well before money, and maybe will exist well after money. That's a conspiracy theory, Illuminati. So that's my kind of wisdom that I borrowed from all the podcasts and people that I listened to and I packaged it for you and the listeners. It is, it's so powerful. I mean, really, like I said, every time you speak, I'm just question after question. I do have one question, a final question here for you. But just before I ask it, where in the world can we all find you for more Georgie insights, inspiration, <laughs> motivation? Give us the down low on, you know, are you going to bring your YouTube channel back and focus more on it? You want us all going to Instagram? Where do you want us? How can we find you? Well, best place to find me is in your hearts. No, the best place to find me is on Instagram.com slash financialism. That's F-U-N, fun. And then you'll, you'll figure out the rest of the letters and shillism. it'll probably be maybe pinned below Ari, i don't know maybe it'll be pinned below maybe i'll write a little comment be like hey guys if you want to follow me on youtube subscribe right here i love making youtube it is exhausting ari does a great job let's all subscribe to this channel he's amazing bringing all this valuable content to us just incredible one video in i'm hooked this is a life-changing real people real stories not this who else would interview a person like me? So like, I'm like a rabbit, guys, <laughs> right? Um, so this is that real stuff. And you can find more real stuff on my Instagram page, Financialism, and of course, YouTube. Check out my older videos. The, there's videos for building token economies with your children and teaching them a little bit about money, things like that. Um, my personal investments, my wins, my losses, all of that. And there's not many losses because I hardly ever sell. Uh, I clicked that sell button probably 15 times in the last, uh, probably way less than 15 times in the last, uh, since 2015 is when I started. I barely ever did it. And the first time I did it, I just did it to see if it would work. And it worked. And I sold my Netflix stock, <laughs> which I miss. Uh, <laughs> but once I sell, it's very hard for me to buy back. And I only did it one time, and that was with Apple. Yeah, that, that's a different TED Talk. But um, you can find me on Instagram.com slash financialism i don't think anyone says instagram.com but on no, instagram not anymore <laughs> <laughs> the only thing i can say is i got this cup of coffee here i'm like man i just i want whatever you're on right now that zest and passion of life george are you ready for the final question here it's my favorite really? question to ask all investors let's go baby if i were to give you a non-existent virtual ten thousand dollars right now that would poof over to you where would you take that $10,000 and invest it, which I don't even need to say for the long haul because I know you'd never sell it. 
<laughs> but what <laughs> stock would you put that 10 grand into and give us the why? Okay. So all investing questions have a context. So this $10,000 question is for me, someone who already has about $500,000 in net worth. What I would do with it is very different than someone starting off. So my answer to this question is I would probably, let, let me think about how I want to phrase this because I, $10,000 just being gifted is, is already incredible. And I experienced that once. Shout out to my grandma and my grandpa. A second time, Ari trying to one-up my grandparents on the first time. Like, that's we'll make crazy. It, we'll make it 12 for you. We'll make it 12. We'll just one, top it off. <laughs> now I can spread it out evenly, right? If I'm smart, right? I could spread it out evenly. So what I would do, what I would do is, to be honest, if I have money coming in like this, and because I treat all of my other money, I treated it with such respect. And I'm not going to disrespect this money, but I'm going to take the time to do something that I would not recommend to anyone else to do. Uh, this is something that, Ari, I'm sorry if you're going to lose some subscribers for this. What I would do with this is I would actually go into the world of crypto and NFTs with this. And I would look at... Uh, newly starting projects and because this money i didn't sweat for it right i already sweated for it um and i already built a huge fund where if i stop investing now and just leave everything then within 14 years all of my needs will be covered by my investments that's one of the only reasons i'm doing this with this twelve thousand dollars you see negotiation works i just said something and now all of a sudden two thousand imaginary dollars rich that's pretty good so um I'm going to take that first $2,000 and I would give it to the community for subscribing to the page, right? Because that $2,000 just came just came like that. But the other $10,000, I would take it into new crypto projects. Uh, even though I don't believe that there's much true value there, I think that at this stage in my life, it is okay to gamble with that $10,000 into projects that I believe have some future. So this is basically uh, starting from scratch uh, with the promise of an airdrop or something like that. I would do that. Now, if I were just starting out, there is zero chance I would do that. If I'm just starting out, I would take about $100, YOLO it into whatever, get, uh, get it all out the way, throw it into Tesla, throw it into NVIDIA, throw it into Netflix, throw it into Dogecoin, throw it into some random crypto project so I could say that I did it and I don't have the temptation because behaviorally we're all like oh i want to 10x it well if a hundred dollars gets 10x that's 900 dollars profit that's pretty good so with the rest of it i would average it out through the market into 90 percent index funds 100 dollars to those freak projects and then i would leave the other uh 10 to really study individual stocks and positions of what i think the future can take off so i won't be able to answer that what I would do with that other 10% right at this moment, because I would go into research mode. If it was completely from scratch, I would take the first thousand dollars and I would invest it into education because you could be like me and sit in traffic for four hours a day for like five years straight and learn a whole lot. Or you could buy all that information condensed and maybe a course from someone that you trust or take, um, take lessons that I actually took an investing course at UCLA and invested a hundred bucks there. And that is one way to really speed up the journey is investing in that knowledge as cringy as it is. And as cliche as it is that that's what I would do if I were starting today. And if I were to get it in my position today, so two totally different answers. Great answer. Investors jump onto Instagram, follow Georgie, find the insights, really get on that zesty level of passion for life. It will do wonders for you. I've only been following now, Georgie, since you reached out to me. And I can already tell you every single day I picked up tidbits of insights and knowledge that I've been already using throughout my day to day as inspiration. So, Georgie, I want to thank you again for joining me on Masters of the Market and investors. Until next time, we will see you all there.